or something completely different now. David S. Rubin, a curator and artist, independent curator, author, artist, active in the contemporary arts field for 40 years, currently a regular contributor to the online journals Glass Tire, The Rivard Report, and the Visual Arts Source. From 2006 to 14, Mr. Rubin served as the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art at the San Antonio Museum of Art. Please give a warm San Antonio welcome. Make it warm in here for David S. Rubin! Okay, I'm going to talk tonight about how I became a curator and how my um, curatorial practice evolved. I was born in Los Angeles and grew up in the San Fernando Valley, pictured here circa 1960. The only art I knew in those days was from pop culture, TV, movies, and pop music, and I remain a fan of these mediums to this very day. At 17, I saw The Doors play at my high school, one month before Light My Fire became a hit. My life changed radically when I took a Chinese art history class at UCLA, where my major was philosophy. On a midterm, I was Okay. On a midterm, I was the only student to correctly identify an unknown bronze similar to the one on the left as a fake. It was as rigid as a milk carton, and the mask on the lid wasn't inverted as, as it was supposed to be. My professor sent me to Harvard to study Japanese art, but soon I shifted gears and enrolled in a seminar that led to an exhibition on the cubist Jacques Villon. I got to install his abstract racehorses and sequence them in the direction the horses were moving. As a TA, I installed a real Matisse next to a fake one to teach about the sinuous quality of Matisse's lines. My first full-time position was as assistant art history professor at Scripps College and assistant director of the college galleries. I owe a lot of gratitude to my boss and mentor David Stedman, who gave me nothing but encouragement and some great assignments. David went on to direct two major museums and is now a minister. David chose the title to let me do all the work on black and white or colors. This meant contacting galleries and museums, visiting studios and collectors' homes, selecting the work, writing the catalog, and installing the show. The project also taught me a lot about duality, since black and white is an example of one. Another of David's great ideas was for me to pick 10 paintings by LA artists that I personally responded to. With recent LA painting, I learned how to put pluralism into practice, since I showed many different styles, but looked for the best work in each genre. And I learned what every curator should remember. There are always terrific artists in your own backyard. After David left, I carried on his vision and moved from the number two with duality to the number three with contemporary triptychs. It's really important for a curator to be observant, and I noticed that lots of LA artists were making art in tripartite configurations. So to make sense of this, I organized the show and wrote a catalog to go with it. After Claremont, I worked independently for a year and won a competition to curate the downtown Los Angeles Visual Arts Festival. Since so many artists were then living downtown, I created a conceptual installation with the space organized like an artist loft and every artwork either referencing or literally being what you would find there. Next, I was gallery director at the San Francisco Art Institute, where I expanded on an aspect of the triptych show, Art and Spirituality. Concerning the spiritual included Southern and Northern California artists with an aesthetic sensibility like that of religious art. They dealt with contemporary issues, but were influenced by old masters and Jungian symbolism. After San Francisco, I directed the gallery at Albright College in Reading, PA. The dean wanted me to bring cutting edge art back to New York and stir things up, so I spent six days a month in New York searching out new trends. One show included, included the first artist to use computers, and another alters by artists of Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, and Brazilian heritage. When Visual Aids of New York called for the first day without art to observe World AIDS Day, I took an alternative course. Since closing a gallery would hardly be noticed in Reading, and I had seen a lot of AIDS-related art in New York, I assembled a show on the subject, as well as lectures and panels that included local health officials. Next, at Cleveland Center for Contemporary Art, I moved from the number three to the number four with Cruciformed, which included all master appropriations, abstract and emblematic crosses, and covered numerous topics. We were visited by a nun on the day we were closed, but we let her in, and she actually enjoyed the show, which had some edgy works in it. When the center board asked me to conceive another project like Cruciform, we were in the middle of the culture wars. 
So I started thinking about works that had been censored, such as Dred Scott's Flag on the Floor installation. This or led me to organize the 50-year survey Old Glory, the American Flag in Contemporary Art. And you can see Luis Jimenez's Barfly in the upper right. Although it was not an in-your-face exhibition, two of the works stirred controversy when shown at the Phoenix Art Museum, leading to a two-month media circus. Even Newt Gingrich got into the act on NBC Nightly News, calling on us to close a show he never saw. Nevertheless, in Phoenix, 50,000 people visited the show, and museum membership went up. When the Rock and Roll Museum was under construction in Cleveland, they borrowed the center's galleries and the TV cameras were there. Wishing we could get such attention on our own, I conceived it's only rock and roll to piggyback on their opening. When I was downsized out of my position and hired at Phoenix, the show came with me and it toured 13 venues over three years. A real highlight was taking David Crosby and Graham Nash through the show when it opened in Cincinnati. In Phoenix, I programmed a jukebox with hits that influenced the art. I remember a nine-year-old boy wearing the headphones, listening to talking heads burning down the house which influenced artist Robert Longo. Next, while curator at the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans, I began noticing a lot of bird imagery in art locally and internationally. Since Audubon lived and worked in New Orleans, where there is a park, a zoo, and several streets named for him, bird space was a perfect fit. Responding to the content of the art, I divided the show into four thematic sections. Here in San Antonio, many of you may have seen the psychedelic exhibition at SAMA. It was inspired by Sam's Frank Stella painting, Upper Left, which is the most psychedelic Stella I've ever seen. So I went out looking for more art in a psychedelic style. I installed the pioneering artists in the, sim in the smaller gallery and San Antonio artists in the larger space. While working on the show, I discovered that visionary artist Alex Gray had become a cult hero to millennials. When we brought him here for an artist conversation, people stood in line for three hours and 300 sat outside in overflow seating. The event proved meaningful and relevant to the community at large, especially to younger generations. Today, I am documenting contemporary art as an independent curator and writer. Still keeping an eye on my own backyard, I am mostly showcasing San Antonio artists. Our city has a thriving artist community, although this is sometimes a well-kept secret. So through curatorial projects and writing for online journals, I am committed to getting the word out. After all, our artists are the lifeblood of the city, and it is a real privilege to support them. Just a couple of, uh, couple of good questions. A lot of artists out here I know in the crowd and would-be artists. When you look for something, you look for trends. There are artists here wondering, how could I get him to notice me? Do I look at another trend and try to, like birds in New Orleans. What do you tell artists if there is a trend going on, should they jump on that? Should they stay away from it? Should they contact you directly? How does, how does it work? Well, really, it, it, it comes from the art directly. Um, I go around, I see a lot of shows in San Antonio. I mean, that's one of the things I love most about San Antonio is that we have a really vibrant art scene and it's always changing. That's the interesting thing. Venues come and go, but there's always tons of events going on and I know everybody here is gonna attend uh, Contemporary Art Month events this coming month. But, um, I mean, my job is really to pay attention to what's out there and to begin to understand the relationships. And my advice to the artist is do what's inside you. I mean, art is a reflection of yourself. So, you know, if it's true art, it's what you're about. Just like these Pecha Kacha talks, it's what you're about. Sorry, a couple other things, and I may, I don't want to step on anybody's toes here, but that have been in the news about art and exhibits here. And as a curator, you may know what I'm talking about. There was a certain exhibit at a certain cultural art center on the west side that closed before it opened because people weren't happy with the uh, variety of artists in there. What, what's your take on that? Well, um, I really, I'm not gonna take a stance on it. I think both sides have very valid points to make. I think that it was um, an unfortunate circumstance and perhaps maybe had better communication been going on all along, it wouldn't have happened the way it did. And one last thing, also the uh, convention center had the similar issue with local artists. Thoughts? Well, I actually, I haven't seen the work in question. Um, I, I, I mean, I know how the process works. I've been involved in the selection process myself. And all in all, it's a good and sound process. And also, um, I don't feel that all the art 
that's public art needs to be by San Antonio artists because that would kind of isolate us from the global scene which we're part of. At the same time, I can, I'm not in a position to evaluate this particular artwork because I haven't seen it. And I, also it operates digitally, so I need to really see it to give you an opinion. What a politician. Thank you very much, <laughs> David Rubin. Thank you very much.